Uh, I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, Arriba. And uh, just before I teach, I want to just give a real quick personal testimony of, of how I got into the river and how we've had encounters with God. I was, I was raised in a, in a nice, wonderful, uh, conservative Baptist uh, tradition. And uh, God bless that tradition. We were wonderful people, but we were, we were really taught, you know, don't get too close to anybody who talks too much about the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, some of that stuff could be dangerous. And if you get too close, it could get on you. So um, just, you know, keep your distance. And, and so that, that was raised like that. And I was a faithful, you know, for a while, church attender. And, and on so forth. I walked down near the Pentecostal church on a summer day. And they were out playing their guitars and tambourines. I would walk across the street just in case that stuff got on me. Because I remembered what the pastor had told me. So uh, I went to four years of Bible college, and uh, again, it was more of a traditional evangelical uh, Bible school, and then we were placed into a denominational church that our family had belonged to for, for decades. And uh, I was placed into this church, and after six months, I realized I had, I had two major problems. As a young 25-year-old pastor in his first church, and I'm, I'm facing these two major problems. Number one problem is I'm, I'm in a dead church. That's a, that's a serious issue. You know, I, I was on fire, ready to turn the world upside down, 25 years old, but I'm in this dead church, and nothing's changing after six, after six months. And the second problem I had was that I was the leader of the dead church. <laughs> All right, so it's one thing to be in a dead church, but it's, it's another thing that, like, you're in charge of it. And, and everybody knows that it's, it's dead, and everybody, the community knows it's dead, and the, you know, the people didn't love each other, and five minutes after I would say my final amen, like the place would be empty. There was, there was no sense of fellowship, no sense of, um, you know, of family there. And I, I, back then, I, there's one thing I do need to say about our, our, our church, though. And, you know, one of the things in the Toronto movement is that we have a lot of controversy about manifestations. Have you heard controversy about manifestations? You know, well, you know, we had manifestations in our little dead Baptist church there. And so I don't know why people are getting upset about manifestations. We had manifestations every Sunday. <laughs> like audible manifestations were going. And it, you know, it didn't seem to bother anybody. Everybody was fine with these Manifestations went day by, you know, Sunday by Sunday, year by year. And then we also had, of course, the, the, the left arm manifestation. You know what the left arm manifestation is, right? Five to 12. <laughs> people just, you know, all over the, 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 the congregation, people started lifting their left arms. And but they wanted to get out of there. But what they didn't know is I, they, I wanted to get out of there more than they wanted to get out of there. And I was the preacher. And on Sunday mornings after this, because it was just not an enjoyable experience, we, um, we uh, you know, Sunday mornings would come along, I'd wake up, and Gwen, would, my wife, would say, Dan, we have to go to church today. And I'd say, I'm not going to church. She says, you have to go to church, you're the pastor. So I'm not going to church, I don't like it there, they don't like me, I don't like them, there's no sense in fooling around about this. And uh, they said, Dan, you know, you have to preach. I said to my wife, you've been to Bible college, you can preach, you go. And so we'd have these conversations. And then uh, she would convince me, she says, well, Dan, you know, they give us the check. They pay us a salary, you know. So, okay, I'll go. All right. So, so I went and I endured it for the salary. And so we had a choice after six months, honestly. I'm 25 years old thinking, what are we going to do? Uh, either I'm going to quit this, this idea of ministry. I'm just going to get out of this system, which I'm not enjoying because uh, there must be better ways to spend your life, or, or else uh, I need God to show up. And so we started praying into the night, my wife and I, and started calling up, up, upon the Lord. And to make a long story short, well, I was preaching through the book of James at the church, and in our tradition, we never prayed for healing for the sick. Uh, but at the end of James, it says, if you're sick, call for the elders of the church. 
And so, you know, anoint them with oil. So I preached this one Sunday to my own surprise. I didn't really believe it, but I preached it. And at the end of the meeting, a woman comes up to me and says, my little girl is sick. Would you come over on Tuesday night with the elders and anoint them with oil, anoint her with oil? And I thought, my goodness, somebody actually believes this. <laughs> this is getting dangerous. So I took the elders, and I'm pretty sure I was, I'm pretty sure I was, I was, I had upset the elders because I, I think I had ruined their bingo night on Tuesday night. <laughs> and 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 so we went over, but we didn't know what kind of oil to use because we had never used, we never, none of us ever done this before. This was like against our bylaws, against our constitution, against our tradition. So we didn't know what kind of oil, was it 530, was it 1040, was it Pennzoil, was it Mazzola oil, sunflower oil, butter oil? You know, what kind of oil, it, doesn't, it just says oil. And if you're new, you, you know, just any oil will do. So somehow we found some oil. The bottom line is we prayed for this young lady and ac accidentally she got healed. And, and it, wasn't, it wasn't our fault. I was trying to tell the elders, this is not my fault, you know. I know we're not supposed to do this, but I, it must something, I, maybe it was God. And what, what happened is that became a doorway for the Holy Spirit to come into our church. And um, up, up until that time, you know, the, I didn't really have a theology that Christians can be influenced by demons. That, that's just never occurred to me. Um, but as this thing went along, as this whole journey kind of went along, I, I got to say that this, this, the, the, the elders really helped me in, in, in this journey and this theology about getting deliverance for Christians. Because up until I went to that church, I didn't believe that Christians could be influenced by demons. But after two elders meetings, I was absolutely convinced. <laughs> I'm just telling you the short version, folks. The bottom line is the Holy Spirit came. I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. I started speaking in tongues. Pe more people got, quote, unquote, accidentally healed. More people got, quote, unquote, accidentally delivered from demons that were in their lives for many, many years. And revival hit our church. Revival hit our little community. It skipped from our church to the other Baptist church in town. And after about a year, both me and that other Baptist pastor both got kicked out of our churches about the same time. And so, you know, at first we cried, then we laughed, then we cried, then we laughed. And, uh, but it took us on a journey which uh, took us to Toronto. And in the late 80s, we met John and Carol, and uh, John and Carol Arnott. And just to make a, uh, the, the, the short story is that we were at the first couple of days when the Holy Spirit fell in Toronto in January of 1994. It was absolutely glorious. And the, the presence is still there, folks. We were there, we had a great conference just last week in Toronto. And, and people were there till midnight just receiving the power of God still. So uh, the, the presence is still flowing. May it flow here in Melbourne. May it flow here in Jubilee. In Jesus' name. And I, I, I just sense, especially during the worship, the, the river in this place and the presence in this place. So I know I'm, I'm among a people that love the presence of God. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. So I have some good news and bad news. The good news is that I'm going to preach today that the bad news is I was just in Norway and I lost my watch. So just to let you know, I don't have a watch, okay? Uh, <clears throat> Just try, oh, wait a minute. There's, oh, it's only 10.30. So Luke said till 12. So we're good. It's only 10.30 right now. <clears throat> Don't worry. I know we're on daylight savings time. Everybody okay? Okay. Luke chapter 17. So I would like to share with you today about growing in faith. And uh, I'm doing this because I know you are a Arriba. If I, if I preach and the Holy Spirit comes upon me and I start drinking, just relax, okay? Just give me a five-second drinking break and everything will be okay. Trust me, all right? Arriba. Arriba. 
I'm fine. I'm just a Baptist preacher. Uh. Ha! Huh. What did I say? Luke 17. Okay. <laughs> hoo, hoo, hoo. Lord, let the river flow in this place. Arriba! <laughs> in Jesus' name. Just tell your neighbor he's just a normal Baptist preacher. Don't worry about it. Arriba! Okay. Lord, let the presence increase in this place. <laughs> Bear with me, folks. Arriba. <laughs> okay, I can see. This is going to be one of those mornings, no jacket morning. <laughs> okay. Ha! Arriba. I think there's a number of drinkers in this room. I'm, I'm feeling at home. <laughs> Woo! Don't you like fire? When it's not the heating system, it's like God. I mean, I like that. Arriba. Okay, I, I got to take a minute and tell you that story, and then I'll preach, I promise, okay? <laughs> Many years ago, in Ukraine, of all places, I was preaching. And uh, this word came out of my mouth. This word called Arriba. And I had no idea what it, what it meant. I just thought it was a word in tongue. It was a, a Holy Spirit tongue. And a year later I found out it meant go higher in Spanish. And uh, so if you hear that, what the Lord is prophesying and proclaiming is to, is to go higher. It's prophetic. It's kind of like a, this arrow that, that hits our hearts, that hits our minds. It's, it's God telling us uh, to, in his own unique individual way, uh, because he's God and he gets to do stuff like that, uh, that, we, that, we, that he's calling us higher. Higher in his presence, higher in his glory. So that's, that's the Ariba story, all right? So that happens. So if it happens... Now you know. All right. There you go. The Ariba story. Okay. That's another story I'm not going to tell you. So. <laughs> ha! Just let you know, you know, I study theology. I have a normal brain. All right. Everything's okay. All right. This is Ariba. This is a, a, a missions church, a Holy Spirit church. And I feel the Lord is, is just asking you to go higher in faith with all that he's called you to individually as, as well as a church. And so let's look at what some brief principles uh, about what God says about faith. I've heard your testimonies of what the Lord is calling you to do in Burma. You're going to need faith to do that. What God has called you to do in Kenya and, and in this community, Luke was sharing with me yesterday. So, you know, faith is this tool that God has given to us to to bring a superior reality into a lower existence. Okay, so what faith is doing is drawing on this superior kingdom called the kingdom of God with everything that is in the kingdom. The, the revelation, the resources, the, the zeal of the kingdom, the knowledge of the kingdom, that, that kingdom being brought by this tool called faith 
into a, a, a lower existence, whatever, whatever level that existence is on. And so that's what we're doing. We're dr faith is drawing on, recognizing that, that higher kingdom. And so Jesus is, and Paul are constantly challenging us and talking about going higher in faith. In Luke chapter 17, verse 5, uh, the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. Now that's a good prayer for anybody who is a, a follower of the Lord Jesus. Not to be satisfied on the level of faith that you have. But to pray the prayer with the disciples, Lord, increase our faith. And he's willing to do that. And so even in that scripture, you have this hint, this real clear principle that faith can be increased. So no matter what level of faith you're in today, either individually or as a church, God wants us to go higher in faith. Um, God is looking for faith. It's not just that uh, we're trying to get faith for our, our own merit, so to speak, and something that would benefit us. God himself is looking around the earth trying to find faith. In, in the book of, uh, of, of Luke chapter 18, verse 8, uh, Luke says that when he comes, this is the, the words of the Lord Jesus, Luke 18, 8, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on earth? Everybody say find. find. See, find means he's looking for it. So he's looking for it. He's trying to find faith on the earth. He's trying to find faith in Melbourne. He's trying to find faith in his congregation. He's trying to find faith among us. He's looking for faith. So when he comes, he's going to find faith. In, in Matthew chapter 8, we can go back there as we see this conversation that the Lord Jesus has with a centurion in Matthew chapter 8. The centurion asked the Lord to come to his home. My servant is paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. Jesus says, I'm going to come and heal him. The centurion says, I'm not even worthy of that. Just say the word and I know it's going to happen. And when Jesus heard it in verse 10, of Matthew 8, it says, When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Everybody say great faith. Amen. And so there's different levels of faith. There's different levels of faith. What, what Jesus is saying is that I have not found this kind of faith even in Israel. So the Lord is looking for faith. And then when he says the word great, he's actually measuring it. It's a, it's a word that measures great versus little or no faith. Uh, will he find faith at all? And so faith is measured. God's people, the temple of God, Revelation 11, verse 1, God comes, sometimes sends his angel, and he measures those who worship in the temple. He worships us. That's symbolically, he's, he, we, we get measured at times. And we, he, we get measured not for condemnation, but he, we get measured because he wants to increase us. It, it, it glorifies him and is a blessing to us. Because we've been made to live by faith. So let's look at some of these, these principles of faith. And let's start off with number one found over in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. And let's turn there. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Arriba. Ah. Wow. Okay. Hebrews 11, 1. Out of the faith chapter, in... The writer of Hebrews, I think it's Paul, but it's debatable. The writer of Hebrews says this. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report, testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, 
So that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are visible. So here is the first <clears throat> principle here in, in verse 1 that I want to share with you. And this is the hard part. But this is the real part about faith. This is, this is where we're going to attack religion. This is where we're going to attack philosophy. This is where we're going to attack churchianity or, or vain Christianity. Because in all of those terms, Christianity, um, philosophy, religion, worldview, all of those things, uh, we use the word faith. Faith is very common in our conversation. What faith are you? How's your faith? And, and all this. But let's just, let's just say it the way it really is as God introduces faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Faith is evidence. Faith is substance. Faith eventually has to be turned into something that, that is substance. Something that is, there has to be somewhere along the line, if you talk about living by faith, you're going to have to show evidence, substance, something either touchable, tangible, that you have faith. That's the whole point of Hebrews chapter 11. Arriba. That, the, that what, was, what was, he introduces it by saying this, what is seen, the world, came out of faith. It came out of God's faith. And so, faith released something, and now we have the evidence of God's faith is called the world. He created the world. It's substance. And so, see, this is, this is the challenge of, of, of faith for us, is that as we walk by faith, God is looking for what's the evidence of that faith. Faith is, faith is substance. I, I went to four years of Bible school where I, I was uh, studying a lot of doctrine, a lot of theology, different theological spectrums, and then graduated with a diploma, or I should say I was going to graduate with a diploma, but at the end of our four years, about 10 days near the end, as we were in 10 days going to walk down the aisle and get our diploma, um, our, our Bible school had a rule that you could not come down the aisle, wear that funny dress and that great hat, and stand there with the plat on the platform with the president and get your diploma, unless all your tuition is paid off for the Bible school. Okay, so no credit, no debt, your, your tuition had to be paid off. And so I'd gone for th four years, and God had really provided, I was very, very grateful for it. But 10 days, 10 days <clears throat> was, was left, and uh, I owed $250 on my, on my tuition bill. And it's 10 days, I put four years into this now, looking forward to, with my class, that I've been through all these years together walking up on that platform. But if I didn't have that $250, I'm not walking. I'm sitting there. And I said, Lord, I really want to, I, I want to graduate. And so I prayed, I believed God, and uh, seven days into uh, the, the end of the school, seven days into the graduation, I got a check in the mail, $250. Hallelujah. I said, oh, Lord, thank you so much for that. That's just wonderful, you know, and you're faithful, and that's just great. And I was in my dorm room. I was just walking down the corridor in my dorm room and uh, just kind of celebrating this victory. And I, I walked in to my friend's college room there in the dorm. His room was open. His name was Melvin. And, and Melvin was sitting at his desk looking absolutely depressed. And Melvin says... Uh, and I say to Melvin, Melvin, what's wrong, man? You know, how are you doing? He says, oh, it's terrible. I got, you know, we got a week left, and, and uh, I want to graduate, and I only have, uh, you know, I have $100 owing on my tuition bill. And uh, I really want to graduate. And he was just really feeling the heaviness and the burden of it. But, you know, I was just joyful, and I was happy, and I said, you know, go. Melvin, the Lord provided. He's going to provide for you. And I pray for it. Don't worry, Melvin. I'm going to pray for you. So I prayed for him, walked out of his dorm, uh, walked back to, uh, through the corridor to my dorm room, 
And all of a sudden I heard this voice. I heard this, this, this voice. Well, you know, Dan, you have a hundred dollars. And I said, get thee behind me, Satan. I know temptation when I see it. <laughs> I walk into my room, sit down at my, my desk, and I hear, you know, Dan, you have a hundred dollars. I go to the dining hall for supper. You know, Dan, you have $100. I go back to my dorm room for the evening. You know, Dan, everywhere I went for the next 24 hours, all I could hear was this voice. You know, Dan, you have $100. Now, here's the point. I had studied doctrine and knowledge for four years. You want to talk about homertology, soteriology, eschatology, all, all of those things that I don't even know hardly what they mean anymore. Um, but we studied them. So I, had, I was full of knowledge. But God was calling me as a young man, not just into a life of knowledge, he was calling me into a life of faith. And the lesson that he wanted for me was not doctrine, it was faith. And so for two days, the hound of heaven would not leave me and continued to bark into my ear. You know, Dan, you have $100. And, and so... Finally, I gave in. Go back to Melvin's room. Now, honestly, I'm sure that in those 48 hours, somehow he must have changed positions, gone to the bathroom or something. But I walked in and he was sitting in the same spot, looking exactly the same way as I saw him like two days before. And uh, I said, first I approached him like this. I said, hey, hey, Melvin, did you get your $100 yet? Did someone, you know, did God provide? And... You know, just kind of hoping it wasn't going to be on my faith. And uh, he, sa he, he said, no, I'm still waiting for my $100. And so, have you ever heard any teaching on like the divine exchange? You know, well, that's what happened in that moment. My joy got on him and his depression got on me <laughs> as, as I pulled out of my pocket completely disobeying 2 Corinthians 9, that God loves a cheerful giver. <laughs> I was absolutely, had no cheer, joy whatsoever. Said, here, Melvin. Here, God, I think, wants you to have this hundred dollars. Wow! And he, like, fireworks goes off in celebration. And mourning comes on me. I'm not talking about M-O-R-N mourning. I'm M-O-R-U. M-O-U-R. That mourning. I was mourning. And I'm going, oh God, I really want to go up on that platform with that silly dress. And, and uh, the bottom line is, folks, a couple of days later, I get a check in the mail, $400. I graduate. And that lesson marked me for life. That, that, that faith eventually will have substance. It will eventually have evidence. And this is, what, this is what the Lord is saying in the first half of Hebrews 11. Noah had faith. How do you know? Because an ark came out of it. Sarah had faith. How do you know? Because a baby came out of it. Um, Abraham had faith. How do you know? Well, s some land came out of it. And that faith was so powerful, it is still being activated today in present-day Israel. Faith has substance. Faith has, has evidence. And it goes on and on about those who worked out faith. Joseph had faith, and eventually he had a throne. He eventually had authority. And so God is calling us to a faith that, although, yes, in the second half of Hebrews, and this is a whole different subject I'm not going to get on today, um, that th there are those who suffer through faith or, or, or go through the trial of faith, and, and they don't see the substance until they get to eternity and to heaven. That is true. That is real. But in this earth, 
the Lord is asking us to draw on the resources of superior, superior kingdom. Superior kingdom. And by faith, bring it into our humanity. And all the stuff that goes in with our humanity. Okay, so that's the first point. Faith is related to substance. Number two, the second point. Everybody has faith. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Everybody has faith. In Romans chapter 12, verse 3, it says this. In the context of spiritual gifts, but even before that, Paul is saying to the Romans, I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Now let's stop and think about that. God has dealt to everyone a measure of faith. When you are, when you are born, you get a nose, you get mouth, you get ears, you get a heart, you get lungs. When you are born again, you get faith. In the same way that when you're naturally born, there's certain things that just come with it. And when you are born again, naturally there's something called faith that enters into you that God, as the Holy Spirit has said here in Romans 12, has dealt to each one a measure of faith. That's not to the pastors, the apostles, the evangelists, the leaders, the, the, the leaders of the church. Everybody in this room has been dealt from heaven a measure of faith. So you have it. The question is, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with your measure? Because you have the measure. Are you or I just going to sit back and watch other people use their measure and enjoy that? Or are we going to become a person of faith? So we have a measure of faith. And so the third part, part is this. God wants to increase our faith. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3 says, he, Paul commends the church in Thessalonica and says, I, 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 I'm looking at you, your labor of love, and your ever-increasing faith. And so faith in that church is growing. It is ever-increasing. In, and so faith can increase, that's the third point. But the fourth point, fourth point also is this, is that faith can waver. Faith can go up, it can increase, and faith can waver. It can go, it can get weak. I've been um, meditating recently on what God said to... Uh, God said to, about Abraham in Romans chapter 4. And along with me, I'm sure that some of you who've read this verse kind of have to stop, step back and say, huh? Like in, in, in Romans chapter 4, verse 20, referring to Abraham, it says, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith giving glory to God. Anybody ever read that with me? And kind of, you're having devotions, and you read that verse, and you sit back, and you fold your arms, and you look to heaven, to God, and you say, hey God, uh, really good verse. Uh, just want to let you, just want to ask, uh, have you ever read the Bible? Because the story of Abraham is a story where God says to him, go to Canaan, stay there, I'm going to give you many, many children. 
And so Abraham goes to Canaan for a while, and then he goes to Egypt. And he wavers at what God had told him to do. And while he's doing that, he decides to tell a half-truth half about his wife, Sarah. Hey, Sarah, you don't mind? Just, just tell him you're my sister, if you wouldn't mind. That would be really good so that they won't take my head off because of your beauty and, and take you. And, and so, do you know, you know what I look at that verse in Romans chapter 4, verse 20? And you know what I see? I see God's, God looking at, at Abraham, not in a snapshot photo. He's not looking at him in Egypt. He's not looking at him at the border of Egypt. He's looking at him on his long journey, folks. He's not, he's, he's doing, he, he's doing the 50-year video, not just a a snapshot on your on the smartphone this is what Abraham looks like because all of us at times like Abraham and like Peter come out Lord if that's really you tell me to come out of my come out of this boat he steps out of the boat starts walking on water looks at the waves what does his faith do wavers so he's up he's down he's up and down and Abraham is up and down. Canaan one day, Egypt the next day. But here's the, here's the good thing. Here's, here's Abraham's life. Faith is down there. And it goes up, and then it goes down in his struggle. And then it, Lord, how could I know this promise? Is it going to happen? And then it goes down again. And God takes a picture of, of our lives in our struggles that sometimes do waver, and he commends Abraham that in the long journey, he holds on to faith. Even though on some short terms, he has some struggles. And Abra God, is, God is commending Abraham, a person just like you and me, that is sometimes up, sometimes down, but it's a long obedience in the same direction. And he keeps the direction going the right way. And he keeps the goal in mind. And he keeps the aim in mind. And because of that, even in Abraham's weakness and in his humanity, God's testimony of him is he's faithful. And he didn't, at, at the end, his testimony is he was faithful and he didn't waver. Isn't that amazing? But faith can go up. It can go down. And so the fifth point is this, is that faith must be developed. One time Jesus says to his disciples when they were in the boat, the storm was there. We're going to sink. He wakes up, calms the storm. And he says, why were you afraid? O oh, you, now listen closely in the Greek. O oh, you of underdeveloped faith. That's what he says to him. The faith you have needs to be developed more. So you have faith, you see. Everybody has faith. But it's the question of whether we are developing that faith. And then, and then six. Uh, let's turn over to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, please. Verse 17. Faith comes by hearing, and he hearing by the rhema of God, the word of God. So we just need to talk about, if you're going to have a life of faith, we've got to talk about this for a couple of minutes. Faith comes. It is something that... <clears throat> that will come to you through this vessel called rhema, or faith comes by, by, by hearing. It doesn't, it doesn't come by reading, but you have to hear God's voice in the book. God just didn't write a book. He, he, he also has a voice. Second, Second Timothy 3.16, 
says that when the book was written, it was accompanied by breath. We, we can paraphrase that. It was accompanied by breath when the book was, was written. When the authors were there getting the revelation, it was inspired. It was God-breathed. God's breath was with the book. Here's the good news. God's breath is always with the book. And it's not just the book that gives you the faith. It's the breath that gives you the faith. Arriba. And so that's why Paul used this word here. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The, in, the English word word is not the Greek word logos. And I'm sure you probably know this. But just a reminder, the, 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 the word logos refers to the complete message from beginning to end, the whole Bible. Jesus is the complete message. He is the logos. He is the word of God. We're not going to add or take any way thing from him. He is the logos, complete message. So we're not going to add Muhammad. We're not going to add Buddha. We're not going to add New Age. We're not going to add anything to Jesus. We're not going to add universalism. We're not going to add a theology that says, you're okay, I'm okay. We're not going to add anything to Jesus' words. He's the Logos. But rhema is the personal word for a personal situation. And if you want to live by faith, then you have to hear that rhema. Faith comes by the, the rhema of God. Oftentimes I hear... Preachers quote in Ephesians 6, and in, in, in churches there's Ephesians 6. The sword, we're going to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and, and, and we hold up the Bible, the whole Bible, and quote Ephesians 6, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's actually not accurate. What Paul is saying about the sword of the Spirit that will give you victory in a certain certain situation is that you hear God's rhema for that situation and you cut through unbelief. You cut through your circumstance. You cut through what you're facing by a personal word from God that jumps out of the page and the logos becomes rhema to you and you walk on that rhema. And you know that you know that you know not what God is saying to the person on this side of the church, but what God is saying to you personally. Nowhere in the Bible did it say, Dan Slade, in 1992, I want you to move to Ukraine. I couldn't find that anywhere. I looked. <laughs> couldn't find it. But when I was reading the book of Ezekiel, he told me, I'm going to send you to a people of a tough language. <laughs> I was speaking in tongues, driving down Niagara Boulevard near Niagara Falls, Sharabakita, and that voice came, I'm going to send you to a people. And, he, and God quoted Ezekiel to my heart. And I had international prophetic conference leaders who were well known in North America, and you have one of his books in your bookstore. Call me out in a conference with pastors and apostles all around me. Call me forward. And I was about to move to Ukraine in just a couple of months. And he, and he called me out and said, thus says the Lord, it's not your time. Your place is here. And it didn't move me one bit. Do you know why? I had a rhema. I wasn't intimidated. Test all things, test all prophetic words. I'm not going on the guy's reputation. I knew what God had spoken to me. Because you've got to walk on, on the rhema. Because that rhema imparts the life of God to you. It imparts the personality of God to you. It imparts the resources of God to you. The rhema is alive. 
because the rhema, you hear it, and you live it, and you eat it. It becomes bread to you. It becomes food to you. It becomes wine to you. It becomes life to you, and you become a person of faith. You, you become a person, listen closely, not a person in faith. Like, are you in the faith? Christianity, generally. Yeah, I'm in the faith. I believe in Jesus. But are you walking by faith, personally? There's a great difference. And the fun in the Christian life, and we're going to close soon, folks, so don't worry. Who will give me five more minutes? Just, just give me five more minutes. Okay, five, 10, 15, 20, <laughs> 25, 30. Very generous church. Arriba. See, see if, if, if we don't learn to personally live by faith, all we're part of is a general institution. And it gets boring in a general institution. Do you know why Heidi Baker, she has 200 kids around her all the time, every year, saying, come out to the bush with me and let's, let's, uh, let's see, go to a village that 20 years ago they were cannibals, but let's just see if we can convert them. Yeah. Young people want to be challenged in their faith. This, this walk has got to be some, uh, some uh, uh, adventure, folks. And that's what it is. But it's only an adventure if you get a personal word. It's you and him. Not you and the big church. Not you and the institution of between a billion or two billion Christians on the face of the earth. It's what is God saying to you? Arriba. <clears throat> And so faith comes by rhema. Faith, yes, it will be tested. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7 says, the testing of your faith. And then he compares your faith, which is more precious than gold. So you're a young person here. What are you going to go for, gold or faith? Arriba. When I was 19, I was going to be an accountant or was I going to be in Bible school? And I, God spoke this word to me, 2 Corinthians 4.18. Look at the things which are, not the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. That which is seen is temporary. That which is unseen is eternal. And he challenged me to live, to live by this. And, and I heard a Sunday school teacher when I was 19 years old Quote a verse I heard over and over again. Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things. Does everybody say things. things. See, when I was 19, I wanted things. I thought, yeah, I, I need to get a job, a career, an education so I can get things. And, and God said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. How many need things in this room? I'm the only one that needs things. We all need things. All these things will be added unto you. I was 19, I heard this guy say that, and I said, I wonder if that actually works. I'm 55 today, and I want to let you know that works. That meant for me when I was 19, the money I had saved for my Honda 650 in the showroom, which I had gone and hugged many times, and saved up money for it, was going to go out the window as I went and put on a tie and a shirt and went to Bible school <laughs> instead of the wind in my hair. But guess what? Later on, God gave me two motor motorcycles. All the things get added. Arriba. My aunt died, left me money. God said, buy a nice motorcycle. That's sold now, too. Ultimate, f f folks, it's this. And here's the end, honestly, really. <laughs> Hebrews 11. It's only 10 after 11. Faith will be rewarded. Hebrews 11, verse 6. God is, 
looking for faith. We started with that. When he comes, will he find faith on earth? Hebrews 11, 6 says that those who come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those, a rewarder. Everybody say rewarder. Do you know that God motivates? He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So how many would like rewards? So God taught me a lesson about 10 years ago. God came to me and said, Dan, I'm not communist. What a revelation. And he, along, along the lines, he says, a lot of my people think I'm a communist. Now, let me explain what he taught me with that. See, <clears throat> I lived in Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, and I, for 12 years, and I've been going there for 20, altogether for 20 years. In, the, in, in communism, everybody lives in the same size apartment, you drive the same lousy car that breaks down every three days. You even wear the same clothes. My friend in the 80s who bought, um, brought American jeans to school and wore them got kicked out of school for wearing American jeans. Because we communists, we don't wear those things. We all wear the same things. And uh, you drink the same lousy vodka and you have... All, everything was the same in communism. There is no reward for a doctor or janitor. You can sleep through work. It doesn't matter. You've got the same wage. You could go to work, not go to work. You could do stuff, not do stuff. It doesn't matter. The government provided for you. And there is no motivation, no reward for what you were going to do. Now, folks, let me just say this very sincerely, and I know this is a whole different teaching. Faith, your faith will be rewarded in heaven according to how you exercise your faith here on earth. Lots of times we think we're going to go to eternity and we have the same size cloud, <laughs> the same size little harp, the same size crown in our heads, and we're all going to have the same size uh, little apartment in heaven and go and visit each other and eat cherries. <laughs> and, 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 and that heaven, here's the idea. It, 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 this, it's a wrong idea. I, mean, I know it comes out of Revelation, but just, I'll tell you right now, it's a wrong idea. That it's just going to be one big worship service, and that's all you're going to be doing. Eternity is physical, it is active, you're in a resurrected physical body, there is going to be redeemed earth, you're going to rule over creation, and the Bible says that to some, two cities will be given, to some, five cities will be given, to some, ten cities will be given. He says in Revelation, to him who overcomes, I'm going to allow him to sit on my throne and rule with me. There is something to rule over in the age to come, folks. And if I get a choice between a city block or 10 cities, why not go for the 10 cities? That is New Testament Bible theology. Ariba. And so Paul says, or Hebrew says, you will be rewarded for your faith. You'll be rewarded here, and you'll be rewarded in eternity. It will be worth it all when you see Jesus. Yes, you are tried, going through the fire. That faith which is in you, that gold which is in you, the Lord allows fire to come into it. So that you can, so Job says, that he knows the way that I take. And when I come forth, I shall come forth as gold. Come on. Golden faith is what God is looking for. And for you to do as a church what God has called you to do in Burma, in Kenya, in your neighborhood, in your life, we're going to have to increase in faith. 
Amen? Let's stand together. Arriba. <laughs> Do you guys have that cartoon here? Speedy Gonzalez? You know, I get that everywhere. I just don't know if it's in every country. Arriba, arriba. Go higher, go higher. Come on, Lord. Father, we pray that here in Frankston, did I say that right? Yes. Jubilee Church would go higher in faith. We pray that you impart faith to us, Lord. Arriba. I pray that Burma would be shaken by the faith of this congregation. That Thailand would be shaken by the faith of this congregation. Southeast Asia, Lord, would be changed and challenged. That Africa, Kenya, would be, and other parts of the world. That this neighborhood, Lord, that the superior kingdom would come into our inferior existence. Not just generally, but the, the superior kingdom into your life, into your marriage, into your health, into your hope, into your future. Holy Spirit, come. You're the giver of faith. You're the nurturer of faith. Love comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. Friends, without, without sincere faith, you're not going to be able to love. We know and believe the love God has for us. More, Lord. Let your river flow here, Lord, right now. Let's just wait on the Lord as we... He, he wants to come and... Yes, he does. You don't have to behave yourself during the altar call, okay?